The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. This Australian Investors Podcast episode is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, use the coupon code RASK and secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. We're proud to have the Intelligent Investor as an ongoing supporter of the Australian Investors podcast. As a result, RASK does not earn a volume-based fee. Simply head to intelligentinvestor.com.au or use the link in your podcast player to access your free trial. This episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is also proudly supported by SelfWealth, Australia's leading independent broker. Over 120,000 investors trust SelfWealth with over $9 billion in equities. With SelfWealth, you can trade ASX, US, and Hong Kong listed shares for a flat fee. On a $10,000 investment with Comsec, you'd pay $29.95 in fees. Yet with SelfWealth, it's just $9.50. The thing I like about SelfWealth is the full access to fundamental company data and how easy it is to trade US, Hong Kong, and Aussie shares in one place. You can see your Apple shares and ACDC ETF right beside each other. To join SelfWealth now, use the link in your podcast player or head to selfwealth.com.au and use the coupon code RASK during sign-up. Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. In this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast, I'm chatting to Tobias Carlyle, who you probably know from the Acquirers Funds or from his proprietary Acquirers Multiple. Tobias is an Australian that currently resides in the USA, where he manages an investment firm focused on quantitative analysis and deep value. In this episode, we talk about the efficacy of quantitative metrics like margins, accruals, growth, quality and deep value metrics like enterprise value to EBITDA. This is a really wide-ranging exploration of quantitative investing. To start things off, I asked Tobias if he could have just one investor in his direct messages on Twitter, anyone, past or present, who would he choose to have as a sounding board and why? Here's his answer. It's going to be the most boring answer ever, but it's it's Warren Buffett, of course. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the, Buffett is one of those funny guys where everybody who starts off in investing or starts off liking value investing immediately goes to Buffett because he's very high profile and he's done a lot mm-hmm. of writing. He's very open about what he does. And then I think as people spend more time, he becomes a little bit naff, you know, because everybody's because he's mm-hmm. the first person that everybody thinks of when they first come in. But I think the more time you spend doing it, you kind of come back to him a little bit because you realize, well, I've realized, this is certainly my path. I don't want to speak for everybody else, but I've come back to him in uh, over the last sort of, you know, five or so years out of sort of my 20-year journey doing this stuff because I've 
as I've got older, I've appreciated how amazing it is what he has created. And the fact that, you know, he's 90 something years old, 92 years old, he's still in the seat, still doing what he loves. He leaves on his own terms when he decides he wants to go. I wouldn't necessarily have any question for him that I don't think has already been answered in his, um, you know, in the writings that he's given. And I, I don't know that sometimes I think the ideal of the person is more important than the actual individual themselves because individuals are flawed creatures. But in the <laughs> ideal, you know, the way that he has written and the way that he has behaved, because I think that he's done, he's been, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate to live in an age where the great industrialist of the age has been very open about the way that he has done it. And I think that he's also conducted himself in this very ethical moral way where you know you can contrast him with someone like Carl Icahn who's been quite aggressive and he's had a lot of conflict you know Buffett's not really had much conflict through his mm-hmm. entire career he's never you know of course he's there are, there are you get involved in little conflicts along the way it's just kind of unavoidable but he's had really very little in that way so for me it's Buffett just because he's done so well he's been very open about what he's done and I think he's done it the right way the entire way through being very fair treating his you know his shareholders as partners the way he describes it it's Buffett for me it's a good answer Matt I was thinking about that yesterday about the conflict like you know becoming a billionaire and and running so many businesses history is littered with examples of people that just run into those roadblocks political or otherwise and he hasn't seemed to do that. So that's a, yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, back to you though, mate, let's talk about your story. Um, what I like to do on the investors podcast is just understand a bit more about your backstory and then how that shapes your kind of career progression and then your ultimately your philosophy and investment strategy. So we're just chatting off air. Um, I believe you grew up in Queensland. Many people will know you for operating out of California now. Um, can you cast your mind back to when you were a youngster and then take us from there up to, you know, through uni and then, you know, why you got into legal, into the legal profession and finance. And then, you know, then we'll go up to, you know, the acquirers funds and, and everything you've created since. So I grew up in Roma, which is a little country town in the Australian outback. It's about six or seven hours drive west of Brisbane. Um, that was all I knew until I was about 15 years old. It was great because it's a little country town. It was about 6,000 or 7,000 people. Um, you know, in the morning, I could ride my bike to league. And in the afternoon, I could ride my bike to soccer. And then in summer, we played cricket. Uh, summer, yeah, we played cricket on exactly the same fields. You know, so if you, if you got tackled on the cricket pitch in winter, that sucked. <laughs> but, if you, it, but then, you know, and the first few weeks of the – not that we were playing on – you know, we weren't playing on, uh, you know, turf pitches. We were playing on like the old concrete pitch yeah. with, the, with the super grass rolled over the top of it. And then they just, I think they just covered it over with sand or something, which sounds, which sounds crazy. I don't think you could get away with it these days. But I was very lucky. I had a younger brother who like, you know, liked all the stuff that I liked. So we played, I made him a great bowler because I spent a lot of time at the crease, you know, <laughs> with, the, with the wall as, uh, as the wicketkeeper. And I've, I've got like, I don't have many scars on my body, but I've got one above my eye, which was my brother, who's a pretty good quick. He, uh, we, you know, back in the day when, when the Australians were rampant and there was a lot of sledging, you know, we used to do a lot of sledging yeah. of each other too. And I, he, he went back and I could see him trying to dig it in short. And so I went to hook it for six to teach him a lesson and I caught a top edge. He swears to this day that I didn't touch it with my bat, but I 100% hit it with my bat and it went straight <laughs> into my eyebrow and split my eyebrow open but we had this great kind of you know I'm the I'm the older brother and he's the younger brother we had this great kind of rivalry through our entire childhood and I just my like I wrote this in quantitative value at the start but we had this like family motto and I don't know how it came up but probably it was me crying because he had punched me and my mum said something like look if you if you can't take a punch don't play ping pong and that was sort of, so that sort of became that, like the family motto. Like if you're not going to, if whatever you do, there are going to be consequences for it. So just kind of deal with it. So it was great. It was a really fun childhood. And then school, I uh, only went to grade 10 and it became a, t- it was a TAFE and you could do, um, you know, you could do 11 and 12 at the TAFE, but I, I was, I was pretty good academically. So mum and dad, we, I went away to boarding school for grade 11 and 12 and then I went to UQ to do, uh, I did law and business. 
uh, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but dad said do law because, um, mm. you know, lawyers get paid a lot of money, which, which wasn't true at all, but I, but I did it. And then I, I, um, I went into law first with Cause Chambers Westgard. So I spent four years at Cause. Some of these firms have been taken over now. And I don't know what the, I don't know what the, they've all been taken over by magic circle firms in the, from the UK and from the US, whatever the US firms are called. I just don't know what these what the current names of these firms mm. is, but I'm pretty sure that Cause still exists and I'm pretty sure that Minters still exists. Yeah. So I went to Minter Ellison after that. And I was at Minters for a couple of years and then I got transferred to San Francisco. Right. Because Minters had this San Francisco office, which was basically just doing, because, you know, Minters has got offices all throughout the Asia Pacific. So we'd do, um, you know, if there was a company doing a takeover of another company, then another law firm would sort of be handling that part. And then we'd be handling all of the subsidiary acquisitions or asset acquisitions through the Asia Pacific. And so that was sort of what I did. And just be, by virtue of the fact that it was San Francisco, even though it was 2000 and like three, four, five, when there was nothing going on tech wise, San Francisco was very quiet at that point, but I was, um, I was doing some tech stuff because uh, that's sort of what you do. The, the, the partner who I worked for had come from a, uh, one of the iconic Silicon Valley firms. He was an Aussie who had come from an iconic Silicon Valley firm. And uh, so he still had clients. So we had uh, big, you know, Yahoo was one of our big clients. So we did all of their little bolt-on acquisitions. It was really fun doing all that sort of stuff. But I, I, I wanted to be an investor and I had listed this company in Australia as a lawyer um, pipe networks, yeah, yeah. which uh, I knew the two guys who had, uh, founded it, Steve Baxter and, uh, Bevan Slattery. And, uh, I ran into them in the, in the pub actually, <laughs> and they had just done a placement. They were three sheets to the wind. And I said, they were like looking for a, looking for a general counsel. And I wanted to go back and I kind of wanted to get out of law and I thought that would be a good middle step to getting some commercial experience. So that's, that's what I did. And I did that until, um, basically pipe got sold and, uh, then I had a little bit of money and I just, what I really wanted to do was learn investing. So I went and worked for Troy Harry at Trojan investment management. Troy's kind of an activist. Um, he's a funny sort of activist though, cause he, he describes his strategy as undervalued asset situations with a catalyst. And so frequently he provides the catalyst. So he'd buy these things and then he'd agitate, you know, go to a general yeah. meeting, stand up in the general meeting, talk to the chairman from the floor, you know, push any button that you possibly could to get them to do what they want to do. So that's how I learned what I was doing. And I, then I set up a little partnership in uh, 2010 and I ran that from Australia, transferred to the States because my wife, who was then my girlfriend, but... Uh, we were pretty close to being married. We came back to Los Angeles, which is where she's from. And so we live in this little surfing village in uh, LA now, um, close to her parents. And so I sort of had, I started the business again from the States in 2010, basically. So I can keep on going from there, but do you want to, is this yeah, yeah. along the right lines? Yeah. So um, I guess there are a few milestones there, right? Like the transition away from that kind of pure legal focus into investing. Um, what was the, what, what did you launch in 2010? Like, tell us what you wanted to do and, and why you did it. The, well, Trojan got wound up. Um, right. Trojan was LIC. There was Trojan Investment Management and Trojan Equity. Um, I forget exactly, but it was TJN was the ticker, but uh, it was sort of, Troy wanted to wind it up because he wanted to do other things. So the, 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 the fund itself was wound up and then there was nothing for me to do. Like there was no, mm. there was nothing to do inside Trojan. It was just Troy's money, which he wanted to run himself. So I, I started a little partnership. I started, a, well, not a partnership. It was a, it was a unit trust in Australia. And it was just under those rules where the rules used to be, you could raise $2 million. Yeah. So there was no need to be licensed or anything like that. So I started out doing that and I, I kept that same structure when I came to the States, but it was just impossible to raise money into that structure because nobody wants to go and invest in Australian unit trust from the States. And I was sort of an unknown quantity and I had an Australian, you know, I have Australian degrees and most of my experience was Australian and, and I was trying to be an American investor because that's sort of my experience had been American stuff because I never wanted to have a conflict with Troy and Trojan yeah. when I was in Australia. So all my investing had been in the States. 
And then when you're a corporate advisory attorney, you can't be, it's hard to hold shares in public companies because if you're ever involved in a transaction and the most junior guy in the team's already got shares in the company, that's just a bad look. It's like totally some information's leaked out. So I didn't ever, I didn't really do any investing until it was pretty clear that there was not going to be any overlap. So I was sort of, um, I had been focusing on the States, even though I was in Australia and that, so that was the strategy was mostly focused on the States and the Americans was just, why would I invest in a, in an mm. Australian structure? So I realized I needed a, a US structure. So I set up a limited partnership in the States, which is expensive and they're kind of, um, it's, you know, the, when you're, when you're first starting out, your investors are high net worth individuals for the most part, you're not going to get any institutional money early on. And that means you're talking to doctors and lawyers and accountants and you're giving them a 200 page subscription agreement and constitution. Most of them were just, you know, this is just too much for me to digest, to invest, you know, like $50,000 or whatever in this thing. So it's just pass. So I realized that that was like the sticking point. I went back to the drawing board a little bit and um, I wanted to launch an ETF, which is what I ultimately ended up doing. I've, I've got two now, but the, the, the problem with the ETF, it's a public vehicle. And so they're just more expensive to set up and they're more mm. expensive to operate. So they have a, uh, a threshold of assets that you need to get to before they break, before they break even. I'm just a small business guy kind of running one of these things. And so it was, I needed to make sure I was, I needed to be pretty confident I was going to get to break even and I needed to have the, the ding just to kind of pay for the setup and the initial few years of running it. So that's, that's what I did. I, and I laid the groundwork by writing books and, um, you know, I was active on social media and active on a little website that I created. We can talk about that a little bit too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess the, the thing that I was interested to talk to you about here before we get to the books, because the books, Quantitative Value, did that with Wesley Gray, Deep Value 2014, Concentrated Investing and the Inquirer's Multiple, which we'll touch on that last one in a minute. But um, from what I could tell, when you're a Trojan, it was kind of like absolute returns. Um, and you said like the value plus catalyst. When did you switch from that type of investing to like the quantitative style? And when did that kind of, how did that kind of come into your consciousness and, and become in your mind a superior way to invest? I went through 2007, 8, 9. I was a value guy before that all happened and I was trying to do uh, the little earnings machines, compounders, yeah, and they all got absolutely smashed to smithereens through that seven, eight, nine drawdown. About midway through, I I had read Security Analysis, the original version of it, and I remember the net net thing, and I just never seen net nets before. Well, there just weren't any net nets around. Yeah, and then late to or sort of mid two thousand and eight, they did start popping up on the screen, and so I set up this little website called Greenback, just a blog, literally just so I could write about these positions because I had, I followed a guy uh, who had this website was like NCAV stocks or something like that, net current asset value stocks. Mm -hmm. And he just cheap stocks and uh, he wrote about undervalued land situation. I just kind of loved it. And he'd started writing that in 2002 or something like that. And this was by 2007, like that five years, it felt like a long time. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I had in five years time, if I had some record of what I was doing and I did it publicly, but I did it anonymously because I just thought that's the, you can write freely if you're anonymous. So I wrote these little um, net net positions up and they all did pretty well just because net nets do tend to do pretty well. And it was the low, pretty close Mm. to the low of the market. It started in late 2008 and I did it pretty consistently through 2009 and then into 2010 um, the market, you know, absolutely ripped those net nets, absolutely ripped all the small caps, absolutely ripped through that period of time. And I, I had, um, I had a track record, like that period of time, this is this, this, the, the, the portfolio had done about 250%. So I just felt like I've, I've absolutely smashed the cover off the, <laughs> off the ball through there. But, um, when I went, I stepped back and I looked at the whole cohort the cohort had done even better again because I'd missed a few things that had gone up like 10 times through that period. Right. Where like lots of things were like up 800%, 1000%. And the reason I had missed them was because they were the scariest of the entire lot. 
uh, of that of that cohort, and I had actively, you know, avoided them because I thought, for the obvious reason, these things are going to be zeros. These are yeah. donuts if this market doesn't turn around. And I just didn't realize that, you know, the market basically always turns around. But when it's your first rodeo, you don't kind of know that that's what happens. So I read this this uh, article at that time by, um, by uh, what's his name? Now I'm just blanking on it. Uh, James Montier. Oh, yeah. And it was, called, it was called An Ode to Quant. Mm-hmm. And it's it's hard to track down, but it is still on the intertubes. If you you can Google it, James Montero de Quant, and it probably pops up in his behavioral investing book, or there's some version of it. I've certainly still got it somewhere. He basically described why you why you the, the advantage of being a quantitative, having a quantitative approach to value investments, this anti behavioral bias kind of thing. And at the same time, well, uh, the Magic Formula, the little book that beats the market, had come out in 2006. Yep. And he wrote another article on that, which I read. And I thought, this is a, this is a better way of investing because um, these net nets only come around. They're like cicadas. They come around every seven or so years. And then for the intervening period, you've really got nothing to do because there's none to, to be picked up. And so I wanted something that scaled a little bit better than the net nets did. So I, he, he wrote in, the, in Montier's analysis of the little book that beats the market, he wrote that if you took away the quality metric, which is the return on invested capital metric from the magic formula. So for those who don't know, magic formula is a very simple quantitative approach where he says he's mimicking Buffett. Basically, he's got one metric, which is EBIT to enterprise value, and that's the quality metric. And then he has return on invested capital or return on equity as the, did I say, so EV EBIT is the value metric. Yeah, value. Yeah. ROIC is the quality metric. Yep. Together, that tends to beat the market and it does it really consistently. Montier pointed out that if you got rid of the quality metric, you do even better again. And he looked at it in Australia, uh, Japan, the UK and Europe and the US and basically it beat it in every single jurisdiction except for Japan where it might have mm. tied. I thought, well, that's pretty good. And then I I wanted to test that idea. So uh, Wes Gray and I met through my blog, Greenbacked, and I had just written on the blog, I really want to write a book about quantitative value because this is interesting and I'm not aware of any book. Of course, there's a whole universe of guys who practice this stuff. I just mm. didn't know it at the time. And so we, and Wes was doing his PhD at Booth, which is the old Chicago School of Business. It's sort of regarded as the best quant school in the States. Wes could access all of this back testing data. And so we tested every bit of industry and academic research that we could track down. Um, and one of the ideas that we tested was the magic formula and getting rid of the quality metric. And we tested all these different permutations of the magic formula where, you know, that we called it the academic magic formula where you use price to book as the value metric and you use the Novi marks gross profits to total assets as the quality metric. And we found that that outperformed um, Novi marks total asset, uh, gross profits to total assets is a great metric as well, but it still doesn't really help the value metric. Basically, the driver of returns is value and not, and not quality in that definition of quality. And so that was the, so I just decided then that the best way to proceed was as a deep value guy, we're just focusing on value metrics and not so much quality metrics. And that was the very top for uh, for deep value for about the next six years. So it's been a, it's been a long period intervening. Mm. Um, so on that, um, well, actually, before we get to maybe the discussion about like kind of the nuts and bolts of that, um, can you just explain, I guess, if I could be so crass, just the kind of the books that you've written since Quantitative Value and kind of the, the, the rationale behind writing them? So Quantitative Value was just every bit of academic and industry research we could find, put it into mm. a new testing universe, uh, a model that he had built. And um, we fed it every single thing. So that if, when you look at all, when you go back and look at all of these old um, papers on so identifying how do you find credit risk how do you find something that's at risk of financial distress how do you find fraud how do you find earnings manipulation many of these papers are quite old and so they're written in the 1930s and they're trying to detect you know distress risk in manufacturing firms and yeah, right. the question like is that relevant to today to a more sophisticated kind of different sort of business not sure so we went into, and when you look at these things they've all got weird coefficients it's like you know 0. 0.13 times this thing <laughs> 0. 0.62 times this thing like is that 
real or is that just sort of something that you find from a back test, you know, from a linear regression through a back test? So we test them again. You know, surprisingly, they're pretty, they're, a lot of them are pretty robust. And there, there are some yeah. weird things. Like there's a, one, of the, one of the things that you can use to identify fraud is an accrual. So if you've got a double entry bookkeeping, often when a company is trying to overstate its profits, they, you know, they're, they're using, they're building up assets and they're doing all these funky things in their financial statements to sort of disguise the fact that they're not earning, but they, they're trying to book accounting profits. And so what you get is a big divergence between the cash they're generating and the accounting earnings that they're writing into the financial statements. And double entry bookkeeping means that the way that you capture that is there's a weird accrual that builds up somewhere. So any kind of company that has an asset that's just outsized relative to their business is a little bit suspect, particularly when it's accrued. And I um, was aware that this had been tested and a paper had been written about it. And then in the period after the paper was written, that accru- that metric stopped working because everybody started using yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, of course. But it's still a very good metric. And so after a while, it went out of fashion. And when it went out of fashion, it started working again. So it's, I, I use it to this day. I include it in all my stuff. I don't, I don't expect to ever find anything or kick anything out with it, but I just use it there just because very, very occasionally you find something weird where it shows up with a weird accrual. So there are those kind of ideas. So the thing to remember is that all of this stuff is a little bit cyclical, but, and they're, you know, they're imperfect. So I use lots of them and they're, knowing that they're imperfect around the edges to find you know, earnings manipulation and fraud or stuff that you want to kick out, financial distress. And then how do we define quality? Like what's, what do I really like to see? I want lots of cash on the balance sheet, lots of cash flows, good margins, all those sort of things. Mm-hmm. And then value. We just did a horse race of all of the value metrics. We ultimately, and we, we did like, is it better just to use the single year TTM, the trailing 12 months of EBITDA or are you better off using a three-year average or a five-year average? And we tested every year out to eight years for every single metric and um, including Ford metrics. So mm-hmm. many, uh, they collect all the analyst estimates for these companies, IBES estimates. And um, we just to see which of the metrics was the best. And so we found that there was no advantage to using the averages, which I was really surprised by. Mm. So the TTM is just as good as anything else. And we also found that the Ford estimates are by far and away the worst. If you introduce a human element into the estimate of what the earnings are going to be, it, it, analysts are always way too optimistic. And the only time that they get it right is when there's a turn at the very bottom because they're <laughs> optimistic and then you get the turn and they yeah, kind right, of... of course. So the best metrics to use are trailing 12 month um, and that, that, you know, written into the financial statements, not somebody else's estimate. So... We we kind of built this model, and I just there was some weird stuff that was going on. When stuff gets really cheap, it starts behaving in a funny way because people are trying to dump it out of their portfolios. You know, it's fallen down below some arbitrary mark in terms of market cap or in terms of the share price. Weirdly, you know, there are lots of rules that mutual funds can't hold shares below five dollars or below whatever the mm. number is. So I. Um, thought, well, why don't I just take advantage of all of these weird anomalies? And so deep value was the result of trying to understand the mechanics of why do these things get undervalued and why do they recover? And the answer is simply mean reversion, just that when everything's going bad at the company level, then people don't want to own the stock and they sell it out. And so you get this opportunity to buy these things that are depressed at a depressed part of their business cycle and then at a big discount. And then as they surprise and recover on the other side, you get that big closure in the uh, in the share price discount to the intrinsic value, plus then you get growing earnings. And that's one of the weird things about an undervalued company that if you want fast earnings growth, the time to find it is from something that's been really beaten up and they kind of recover back to where they were. And that's where the most rapid earnings growth is found. It's not in the kind of compounders that are, that are growing very quickly. This has been sort of an anomalous period that we've gone through. Usually it's in the, the mean reversion stuff and you can sort of see it. It's become more obvious in the last six months. Like when you look at the earnings of all of the things that like the airlines or the, the cruise lines, like they bounce back and that's the sort of accelerating earnings that you want to get into your portfolio. So deep value is just a way of kind of capturing those ideas and explaining the mechanics, explaining what activists do, explaining what private equity firms do. After I'd finished that, I got approached by some guys who had interviews with Charlie Munger 
uh, Christian CM, who's the Nordic Warren Buffett oil and gas guy. Uh, uh, Glenn Greenberg from Brave Warrior, formerly Chieftain. All these guys who run 25 years of, in, you know, 25 year plus investment records of outperformance and they're concentrated value investors. And so that was concentrated investing. I looked at it from an academic perspective, from an efficient markets perspective. Then I looked at it from like a Benjamin Graham value investing perspective. What does Benjamin Graham do? What does Seth Klarman do? What does Buffett do? What does Munger do? What does Greenberg do? All of these guys. And uh, just to describe, how do you manage your portfolio? Because there's a lot of alpha in getting good at managing a portfolio beyond sort of just selecting the stock. So that was like half of the battle really is getting good at managing your portfolio. And a lot of these guys say that about 20% or about a fifth of their returns come from trading around positions. So they buy more when it's down, they sell it out when it's a little bit up. So Lou Simpson was the other one. There were long interviews with Lou Simpson who ran Geico's equity desk for a long time. And he, he said that as well. That you, you know, they know these stocks so intimately when they sell off, they're comfortable buying a big chunk of it. When they run up a little bit, they trim it back, never out, just sort of trimmed back to a smaller size. And then uh, I wanted to write a book. I'd written all these books. My mum and dad aren't stock market people. And they just, they said, you know, all this stuff is too hard for us to kind of get through. They're not yep. dumb. They're just not, you know, what is EBITDA? If you don't have your head in this stuff all the time, you don't really know. So I wrote a book. The yeah, that was uh, acquire as multiple, and that that book is just the idea was you can read it in two hours. It's written to a fifth grade reading level. It's got lots of pictures in it. I'm trying to just describe at a very high level what I'm attempting to do, and I contrast the magic formula and break its components down and just show folks what the performance of the um, you know just the value part or the value plus the quality part, and why I. Sp- why I favor value over trying to find two, you know, this particular definition of quality, which is return on invested capital, just because it's very mean reverting and why you would do that. So that was, that's the books. And that's sort of the, it's a pretty good overview of the way that I invest, I think. Yeah, for sure. There's, um, there's a lot to um, pull on through there, but bef- one more question before we kind of get really nerdy on the, the multiples and quality and value. Bring it, cetera. mate, bring it. Um, is a question that I kind of pose to a lot of people who are prolific writers is, do you think there's a connection between being a, a good writer and a great investor? Like I think we've got a lot of really good uh, examples. Maybe that's confirmation bias. You're the quant brain here. So maybe you can um, sort out the survivorship bias for me. But do you think there's a, an association there? And do you think like for you personally, it brings clarity of thought or, you know, how would you think about that? Warren Buffett has said that he doesn't understand something until he writes it down. So he uses his annual letter writing when he writes to the shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway. For me, it's the exact same idea. You know, if we, it, you understand all of these things in an incohate way. So I would say that there are lots of investors who don't write who are very, very good investors. They're just and they're, they're not great at articulating what they're doing. But they, are, you know, so Kathy Wood who runs Arc. I, you know, I, I don't really know. There's sort of, it's, she's a very polarizing figure. There are people who think she's an investment genius in the next Warren Buffett, and there are people who think she's an idiot And they've, when they read what she's written. But I think it's entirely possible that she is just one of those people who understands this stuff maybe at a subconscious level, and she can't necessarily articulate why she's in or even though she does articulate, but I don't know that it's necessarily she's describing what she's doing. And I know lots of people like that. They're good investors. But when I when they explain to me what they do, I still don't really understand what they're looking for. Mm. Having said that, I'm I'm not one of those people. For me to understand something, I have to I, I don't understand what I understand until I write it down. Because you often find if you try to explain something to somebody, then you realize the parts of it that you don't understand. Because you, you've got someone standing there saying, Why, why, why? And you're like, Oh, I don't really know either. So I should <laughs> go back and find out. Yeah. And so that's why writing's good. And having been a lawyer, I'm imagining all of the objections to what I'm saying. And so I'm trying to get in front of the objections that I'm going to hear when I write this stuff down. And so I try to, I try to answer those questions as I'm writing. So for me, it's an essential part of my process, understanding what the process is, writing it down and articulating it for people. The problem is that I involve, I've evolved over time too. And you know, the things that I, quantitative value is almost a decade old now. You know, there are th- quantitative value is a very good book. Um, 
I say that because I co-wrote it with somebody else and I don't want to trash that book too much, but it's, you know, it's a good, I think it's a good um, survey of the research as it stood at the time. I would say that my style has evolved over the years in the decades since, and I'm probably, I do incorporate more quality metrics now than I used to. I still am very wary of the ones that are highly mean reverting, like return on invested capital, but there are things that are very good. And we did write about these in quantitative value. So margins, you want fat margins, you want stable margins, you want growing margins. I think that's almost the most important part of the quality of a business. And the margin is just, what are you paying your suppliers on one side? What are you charging your customers on the other side? And what are you keeping for yourself in the middle? And it just makes sense that if that's big or growing or stable, then you're doing something that is difficult to compete away. And that's a good business that you want to own. What's that worth? That's a different question. That's a harder question to answer, but I, that's the way I think about quality in those terms. So um, when you think about the margins then, are you talking, like, I, I would imagine it might be horses for courses because if you're looking at gross margins, that might be like a software or finance business. But if you're looking at, um, you know, narrow margin, yeah. yeah, like you might be looking at a, at a industrial business, a retail or a bank, something like that. Um, if you if you could pick one of them or like pull on one of those threads quickly, like what are you looking at when I know you've got like exposure to financials, um, or like it just happens through like the formula, right? So, what are you thinking about there in terms of margins and well, there's two there's two ways, and we did write this in quantitative value that basically you either want a very fat margin that is very stable, mm -hmm. or you want a very stable margin. That is, that is wider than usual, which sort of indicates they've got some either buying skill or protection, you know, it's a commodity input and like a, a specialized. So chocolate has always been a great example. So, you know, when Buffett first started out, chocolate was like a commodity, uh, the chocolate mm -hmm. bar was a commodity, which is why, you know, his experience, he tells the story of, um, I think it's Pritzker getting control of some little chocolate company and Pritzker did this this unique buyback where they had this huge inventory of cocoa beans and cocoa had run up a lot. And Pritzker said, if you come and hand in your shares of this company, we will pay you out in, <laughs> in cocoa beans at a discount to the current, at to, to the prevailing cocoa price. And then you can go and cash your cocoa chips in <laughs> for more money. And like, because mm. Pritzker had worked out that he could get a tax advantage. He, for some reason, he was able to get it Attack, he was crystallizing a tax loss on the sale of the cocoa beans and also doing this buyback in an undervalued stock. Very clever maneuver. Buffett figured out the arbitrage and he was taking the shares and exchanging them for the cocoa beans. So that was at that point in time. But since that point in time, chocolate has become more of a branded. So, you know, we know what Cadbury mm. is in the States. It's Seas Candy or something like that. So you would, you, you would pay a premium because you recognize Cadbury and you might not recognize the store brand chocolate in the, you know, in the store. So they're taking a commodity, cocoa, sugar, milk, whatever, turning it into something that's got a big premium on it. And so that's how they're getting a big margin on what they're doing. For banks, it's a little bit more difficult because they're basically they're commodities on both sides. They're getting squeezed on what their cost of capital is and what they're, what they're selling the money for on the other side. But there are some that have this for whatever reason they've got better distribution or they've got cheaper funding sources or they're able to charge a little premium because they've got a different clientele and so i try to or you know they just get too cheap relative to what they're making that's the other thing that you can do so financials have all, had all been really beaten up in the states in particular because 2007 8 9 the credit crisis um, blew a lot of guys up so even though they're cheap and they've had all these reforms, which means they're more heavily capitalized than they were in the past. And even recently, they've had capital controls. They're not allowed to do buybacks, not allowed to do all these things, but they've got fortress balance sheets, earning lots of money, can't do anything with the capital. So I think they're a different beast to the ones that were around sort of 10 or so years ago. And so I, I you know, that it's no, there's no big macro call. They just happen to be the, the, so when I first started, I think there were more than 50% of the portfolio. They're down now to sort of 35% of the portfolio, but it's still a bigger weighting than, than the index. And so that, that stands out. But, you know, I'm, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not a macro guy. I just sort of go where the, if it's mm. cheap and if it's got some protection in it, then I'm 
then I then I will buy it. And even then, I would say, you know, the commodity gold miners right now, I think commodity gold miners look really interesting because the ones that have survived to this point have a different. I say they've all got religion. They've got a different approach mm-hmm. to, you know, managing their balance sheets, managing what they're paying people. You know, issuing stock has sort of all gone away. They're sort of net repurchases of stock many of these companies so I, I think that gold miners are super interesting right now so it's it's sort of there's no um plan so much as we just run the model and whatever sort of shows up is is what we go I always said about my wife you know I just go where the trade winds blow but she says that's really cringe and I'm not allowed to say it <laughs> uh, well we'll give we'll, let, we'll allow you to do that here um okay so tell us about um Tell us, just walk us through the acquirer's multiple, your proprietary formula. And, um, you know, I was pr- got kind of blown away when you did those those tests and the back tests and you compared it to, say, the magic formula because a lot of people would be familiar with that, right? Um, can you explain the components? And because you're rules-based, effectively, it's rules-based investing. Um, so can you explain kind of how that manifested and then the inputs and variables you considered as you went along i have to give it to james montier because if i hadn't read his piece in 2006 or whenever it came out on the magic formula i would never have had the idea which we then tested and sort of showed that it seemed to be the case which is that the value that as i said before the magic formula is sort of two really simple components Mm. and then i focus on the value side of it because that gives you better performance I've since discovered that the reason that you sort of tend to get the better performance is it's a little bit more cyclical. You do have periods of time like the late 1990s value really sucked while the growthy sort of dot coms did really well. And if you had been running the magic formula through that period, you sort of were able to keep up with the market. And so you were unlikely to have lost your job through that period. And the same things happened over the last five years. If you're more of a magic formula guy, you, you did have at least enough weighting towards the quality components, the higher growing stuff that you probably would have kept your job. Whereas as a value guy, you know, it got very dire. The, the spread between what deep value was doing and what the rest of the market was doing got really wide. And it's it's only sort of closed over the last six months or three months or month, depending on how you measure it. But the way that I sort of, the, 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 over, the prevailing idea, the overarching idea is that I'm looking for undervaluation more than I'm looking for quality. Right. But I have a definition of quality that, as I said before, it's, it's not that I don't like. I want to see margins. I want to see good balance sheets. I want to see uh, these things earning cash. And ideally, I want management buying back stock because I think that that shows you a lot of uh, three really important things. One is that management is aware of the fact that the stock is undervalued and doing something about it. So that tells you that management, you know, mm. is looking after the shareholders. The other thing that it tells you is that they do really have the free cash flow there. You know, that lots of times they write in, the free cash flow shows up, but for whatever reason, the free cash flow keeps on getting consumed, you know, and <laughs> it's not going into the maintenance, but it, it really it really is sort of required in the business. So those two things are very important. And then I think it does show over, uh, sorry, undervaluation in the sense that if it's a material buyback, the only way you get a material buyback is if they have a material amount of free cash flow relative to the value of the company. So very, very expensive companies, it's hard to do material buybacks based on the free cash flow because the, the company's just too big relative to what they're earning. So those three, three things, that's a very important signal that it sends. So I incorporate that into my model too. So the things that I own tend to be net repurchases of shares. And the things that I'm short tend to be net issuers of shares. And those two things just alone, net repurchases tend to outperform by something like 5 to 7% a year. And net issuers of stock tend to underperform by the ch- to the tune of like 2 to 5% a year. So that's a pretty good margin. That's on average over the very long term in any given year. Who really knows? And over the last few years, it's sort of been the other way around because the mm. The tech companies tend to be, they issue like 15% of their stock goes out the door as share-based compensation every year and uh, they've been outperforming. So that's sort of blown up the model a little bit. But over the long run, on average, that's the way it works. And so that that's that's in the model too. So that's basically what it is. It's, it's really simple. It's just looking for undervaluation, looking for pretty good quality in the business, some protection in the business, which I think is demonstrated by the margins. And then you want to see what is management doing about that if they're net repurchases. Then we've got undervaluation, good company, good management, and I buy those things. When you say 
when you're talking about cash conversion from accounting profit to cash flow, are you talking about net operating cash receipts or are you talking about cash receipts, like gross cash receipts? Like how are you, how are you quantifying that? Many different ways, but basically there's two, there's two approaches. You want in any given year, you want operating cash flow to roughly match your operating earnings. Yep. And, and when there's a big divergence between the two, but you know, in, in any given year, just the timing of cash flows is different from when they write it into the book. So for an accounting perspective, it's different from a cash flow perspective, even though cash flow is a reconstruction of uh, the accounting numbers. It's not like a pure look at what's actually running in, in terms of cash, but it is a, it's a better proxy. And the, and then you have this additional catch, which is the, the accruals metric that I talked about earlier, where if you see the accruals swelling up year after year after year, then that's it. And then if it becomes a material part of their assets, then you need to be concerned about that because that's often, that's been associated with frauds many, many times. So Parmalat had this gigantic accrual that they said was backed by a billion dollars in cash in this little bank. The auditor went out to ask them, you know, they, they sent some junior <laughs> auditor out to the bank. They said, can you give us a letter saying that Parmalat has a billion dollars in cash in its bank account? because they're missing all of these interest and bullet repayments on their debt over here. And why aren't they just using the billion dollars in cash over here? And so the bank guy said, yeah, no worries. Here's the letter, but they were in on it too. So that it's very, very hard to detect fraud if the people involved in it are trying to mislead you, which, you know, definitionally they are. So you have to look out for these little tells, for these little statistical indications. You know, and it was true also of, so John Hampton talked about Joseph A. Banks potentially having, uh, they had this weird accrual in their inventory, and their response was, "Well, we're a suit manufacturer, we're a suit retailer. If a man walks into a store and he's going to buy two or three or four suits, and they're not available in the store at the time, then he's not going to make the purchase. So we have this huge inventory of suits." And then they were initially they were approached by Men's Warehouse to be acquired, which would mean naturally that potentially that the fraud was uncovered and instead they turned around and bought men's warehouse so the fraud was never uncovered if there was any i don't know i'm just sort of i could see the reaccrual that john had pointed out and then now they're out of, they're out of business you know because they've gone bankrupt so who really knows what happened there we'll never know but you know that that accrual again just watching the accruals would have kept you out of that situation because Joseph A. Banks and men's warehouse like they were cheap on a net net basis because you were looking at that accrual in the inventory and that that forms part of your analysis on a net current asset value base inventory is one of the, the things that you consider. So I, I, I think it's a very good metric for uncovering weird things going on. And I've got lots of examples over the years. I've just collected them of, uh, you know, I find weird accruals all the time and I just sort of put it in the back of my mind and just, just watch that company and just see, hmm. you know, over the next, because frauds take a long time. You can survive for a really long time. And that's the other thing that I've noticed that companies that are doing really well, you know, they don't tend to have financial distress or fraud or earnings manipulation just because they don't need it. Companies that are going really badly that who are in financial distress, that's when the fraud and the earnings manipulation turns up. So I use all the metrics in concert. And when you find one indication, often you find other indications at the same time. Very rarely do I tend to buy those companies because the other things that we're looking for on the quality side mean that those companies just don't enter into the universe. But I screen them out initially anyway just so I would never hold them, but they are potentially in the short screen because mm. I, I run the, the acquirer's fund is long short. So we tend to be short some of these things. I always say it's statistical earnings manipulation, statistical fraud, statistical financial distress because I don't want to get sued by anybody for saying that I think that any of those things are there. But the models often say, you know, those things are there and it's very occasionally one of them turns out to have been the model was right. You know, it, it did pick up something that was a little bit off and it shouldn't have been there, but that accrual or that differential appeared. And, and, you know, the most famous one is the Enron. Enron was sort of trading assets and booking gigantic accounting profits and then there was no cash flow coming in as a result of these sort of related party deals. It's a good, it's a good metric, and it, even though it sort of went out of fashion for a while because it was so popular, weirdly enough. Mm. Um, when you're looking at, you know, those accruals, are you looking at things like days inventory, um, receivables, et cetera? Like, are you getting that granular with your, your screens? I tend not to because it tends to be a business. It's a, it's a business by business yeah. proposition. For some companies just have a long inventory cash conversion cycle. 
and some companies have a very short one. I, I think that you, the, the best way to do it is just looking at it relative to its own history. So, yeah, are, are accruals growing? Are those the payable days blowing out? Are those sort of things happening? Because, and you know, there's also a seasonality and a cyclicality to businesses just to kind of complicate it further. So they're all really just looking at the very fringe for those things. But I, I and I, equally I'm wary when those things turn up in the short screen because if, if you've got, you know, Mark Cahota is he's a very famous short seller in the States uh, you know, he's, he calls it getting the Jaguar out of the tree. Hmm. It's like, you've got to be very careful when you're getting the Jaguar out of the tree because they come down and they eat you on the way down. But when you've got a management team that's, you know, potentially doing something fraudulent or messing around with the accounts, like the very fact that you've sort of think that you've found that doesn't really mean anything. Like that fraud can persist for years and years and years and it can go up 30% a year for years and years and years. And if you're short, it can be, you know, dangerous and damaging to the portfolio so it's really hard both ways you definitely don't want to be long them but you know that doesn't mean you necessarily want to be short either Mm. how much of um how much of the fund and strategy is short relative to long what's the exposure you tend to run tend to run about 70 percent net yeah it's about 100 percent long and about 30 percent short but i can get up to 130 percent long with 30% short, so net would be about 100. But for the most part, on average, it'll be about 100 net, which is the, uh, that's the way the Tiger portfolios tend to be run, about 130 uh, gross, 70% net. Yeah, right. Um, and how about in terms of, you know, diversification across the book? Because you mentioned there, like, um, the short side tends to, you know, you have to be, I think, you know, it's short, you have to be right on the fundamentals, but you also have to be right on timing, right? Because you can't be there forever. So how does the, how do you, how is a portfolio, you know, spread across individual securities or positions? Like, do you, do you consciously make decisions about how many positions you have or weightings, et cetera? Yeah. So that's, there's a lot of work on that part of it. And the, the, the problem with shorts, when you're wrong, they go against you, they get bigger and bigger in the portfolio with a long if you're wrong and it's just so bad you can't get out of bed in the morning and you just want to lie under the covers of the bed kind of groaning to yourself about how stupid you are you know that problem eventually just goes away you don't have to do anything about it with a short that problem keeps on getting worse and you got to excise that at some stage you got to do the meatball surgery to get it out of the portfolio you know (laughs) like some like some explorer lost in the desert chopping his leg off, you know, so you never want it to get that big. So the trick is to just keep on, start them off really small. And then when they run against you, trim them back and just eat your losses along the way. Always keep it to sort of a constant size in the portfolio. And then the other things that I do, I never short uh, anything that's heavily shorted. So I screen out most heavily shorted right. stocks. We won't even consider them because then, you know, you're trapped in there with the other guys. That had always been a very theoretical consideration for me until uh, like Q4 last year, Q1 this year, when, uh, you know, all of those those crazy shorts started running. Like I would never have been short GameStop because I thought GameStop was more a long than a short because it was sort of a net cash company, deep value type position. But when that started running, you know, that blew up a lot of guys. Mm. And then, you know, it's at the it's at this sort of very vertical part of the, the short runs. But, you know, even being, if you were anywhere along that short curve, you were getting hurt because there were lots of things that ran up in concert. So my short book over some of those quarters was up like 30 or 40%. It was painful to be mm. short some of that stuff, even though they're ultimately the garbage companies. It's just you tend to be in there with other guys. You've got shorts that overlap with GameStop and they've got to scramble to get out of everything that they possibly can. So everything was sort of running up. And a lot of guys, including like Bill Ackman, sort of swore off shorting. I'm enough of a contrarian that I was like, you know what, this is probably about as good an opportunity to short as you're ever going to see. So you should leave the shorts on. And ultimately that's turned out to be right because it's been a better quarter for shorting for me so far. It's probably the best short performance that we've had. The shorts are doing better than the long book at the moment, even though the long book's pretty strong. So uh, you've got to be careful with the shorts. That there, there's lots of danger in them. But I think that as long as you're small and, you know, my motto is uh, – he who ups and runs away lives to run away another day. So that's what I, that's what I try to do in the short book. It's not a bad motto to have. Um, 
So I know you've you've got the ETFs right. Um, how, how does it you know from an from an absolute return or you know long short fund perspective? How does it vary? Like we don't have many of them on the ASX, you know, here in Australia, we don't have many active long short funds in an ETF vehicle off the top of my head. Does that add any type of complexity in terms of liquidity for the portfolio? It adds a lot of back-end complexity. So yeah. there, are, there are lots of little compliance programs that I wouldn't have to be engaged in if I wasn't short. Uh, so it just makes life a little bit more complex from a compliance perspective. We have liquidity risk management programs and things that we have to implement and report on and record on a regular basis. So that does make life more difficult. And then, you know, most people are a little bit scared of shorts for good yeah. reason. So they, they, they tend to avoid them. I just think that the market where it is at the moment, it's nosebleed expensive, even though it's come back the last few days, it's still very, very expensive. I think we might have topped out at like north of 37 on a CAPE basis, on a cyclically adjusted PE basis, and now we're like 35 in the States on a CAPE basis, which is just as expensive as it gets ever, really. At some stage, I think, I'm not predicting anything, but at some stage, there'll be a big collapse. And the shorts in that environment should go down more than the rest of the portfolio, and they should provide protection. So the, really, the function of the shorts is to protect the book through an extended bear market, you know, when you have t March 2020 was a flash crash rather than mm. a bear market. If you get a 2007 to 2009 bear market, you know, in my opinion, the defining characteristic of those things is you get like 15 rallies that get sold. Every time the market runs up, it gets sold again to a lower low and people just get exhausted. You know, you're 18 months into it in the 18th rally that's got <laughs> faded trading down to a lower low and people capitulate at that point. Nice thing about being long short, when the market's going down, the short should be going down faster. And then you have this rebalancing mechanism where I'm always taking away from the winning side and feeding it to the losing side. So the, sh the long book is getting longer and longer as the market goes down and when the market turns. So it should protect capital on the way down. And then when the market turns, you you're super long and fully invested and you catch it on the way back up without knowing when it happens, without having to time the market. You're sort of naturally longer and longer. So that's why I really like it and I think it should work. I also hope to generate alpha out of that short book, but the main function of it is to protect it on the way down. Yeah, for sure. Um, there are a lot of people are across the kind of the conversation around growth and value, right? In terms of, you know, knowing that growth has had this kind of spectacular run as rates have fallen. Um, what you know I'm, I'm thinking about in terms of like the quality aspect of the way you think and then the value aspect of you know going hand in hand and the tilt between the two in terms of like how you attribute returns and alpha over time to each of those components do you see do you foresee then you know from if you were only if you were long only say do you foresee that the the value side of that equation is going to get more um profitable as you look forward yeah, so I, um, you know, I run Deep. Uh, the Roundtill Acquirers is a small and micro fund, and the ticket for that is Deep D E D E E P. Mm. It's long only. It's just a value small and micro fund. So it's you know, the last five years, ten years have been very tough for value, particularly for small value. When I looked at the portfolio when we set it up in October last year, the yield on that portfolio was six percent. And this is in a world where the 10 year was under 1%. And I thought there's just, at some point, you don't need any multiple re-rating in these stocks for these to outperform. Like just the yield alone will help yeah. these companies outperform the rest of the portfolio, the rest of the market, sorry. Markets, the, the small and micro has had this violent run since October last year. And it's, I think it's still very undervalued. It's a little bit, it's like a 4% yield now rather than a 6% yield. When I look at um, what's happened to value versus quality. So in 2015, the spread between the most overvalued and the most undervalued was as tight as it has been over like the last 30 years, which means that you weren't getting any discount to buying these. So, you know, value stocks are, tend to be slightly less good, but much cheaper. And you get paid for being much cheaper. And the quality portfolios or the expensive or growth or glamour or whatever you want to call them 
tend to be more expensive but better, but they're not as good as they are expensive. And so they tend to underperform. And people buy them because they're the lottery ticket type stocks. It, you know, all the really good stuff is going to be in that expensive bucket. It'll be Microsoft 20 years ago or Amazon or Shopify or whatever. Like those companies never really get cheap because everybody knows that they're phenomenal companies, mm. they're phenomenal businesses, and they will do very well over the long run. Having said that, in 2015, the spread was very tight. You weren't getting compensated for being a value guy. You should, the mistake that I made at that point, I should have transitioned. I should have been able to, or the model should have been built in such a way that it pushed me into the better quality stuff and away from the value stuff. Now it's the reverse situation. The spread, even though the spread has collapsed quite a lot in recent times because the the, the growthy stuff has come back a fair bit. Mm. The spread was very, very wide, like as wide as it has been through the whole data set. And I always thought that the, that's why I wanted to be long short because at some stage I was going to capture that, you know, that sh- the collapse in the, in the expensive stuff. The long stuff is sort of about of its long run mean. It's not cheap either, but it's not super expensive the way the growthy stuff is expensive. So I think that what we need probably is a shakeout in the markets for value to really start working, even though it seems to be working at the moment following the shakeout in March. I still think that was sort of the... You know, you don't call it the entree in the States. <laughs> For some reason, the entree is like your main meal in the States. But, you know, in Australia, the, the entree is where it should be. The, the first part of the meal, I think that March 2020 was kind of the entree. And I think the main meal is coming yeah. at some point in the future. And that'll be a very extended bear. At the end of that, that was when that is when I think value will really start working again. And I think that through this whole thing, uh, the, the quality tech, growthy stuff is going to get smashed to smithereens. Hmm. But over the long run, you know, value tends to be an evergreen strategy. It does tend to work quite well over the long run, but it is cyclical. It, it, much more cyclical than I kind of realized. Since we've got the data to about 1950 point in time data, there have been six of these periods and they've all been associated with pretty, um, you know, booming, bubbly type markets like the dot-com or the electronics or the conglomerate manias that have happened in the past and the current one which is like a dot-com 2.0 type mania so i I would rather be a value guy in this market yeah yeah it's um i think a lot of people are kind of having interest introspection they're they're thinking geez um what we've seen in the last six months not just in the states but also around the world like here in australia uh people's coming around to it right so um happy days ahead for you mate um i hope so (laughs) so um you know for people who are unfamiliar with your work and people who want to follow along with you. I know you've got podcasts, you're on Twitter, site, ETFs. How can Australian investors, and, and we have a lot of global listeners too, how can people learn more about you and follow along and get in touch with you and all that? I the, the I have a website, acquiresmultiple.com, which just we put uh, run by a bloke in Australia, Johnny Hopkins, and I kind of chop it all up and, and, and make that site. Um, that that has I you know I do podcasts and I interview people and, and Johnny finds great articles and research and we put that up on the site and that sort of gives you the flavor of what we do and that's a good you can find the books and everything on that site if you on Twitter my handle is greenbacked it's G R E E N B A C K D it's a funny spelling it was like I was trying to do an homage to punked you remember yeah. that old Ashton yeah. Kutcher show from years ago. <laughs> that seemed like a great idea at the time seems like a less good idea now. But whatever. <laughs> And uh, and then I think that the books have been uh, – I didn't realize this, but you couldn't get Acquirer's Multiple, uh, the hard co- – the, like the – not hardcover, but the paperback wasn't available in Australia. But I just got a notice from Amazon saying it is now available in Australia. Huh. So I don't know what they're charging for it, but it's it, it's supposed to be a pretty cheap, easy-to-read book. It's written to a fifth-grade reading level. It was literally written for my family who were like – we understand roughly what you do but we don't understand all these terms like can you just explain it to us you know it's so it's written it's written for you you don't need an mba you don't need any of the lingo to understand it you just need you know to be a reasonably intelligent human being be able to get through it and understand it that's probably the best place to do it yes right okay i'll put all the links in the show notes um and links to your twitter as well because it's always a bit of fun especially watching you on youtube um with the boys it's um yeah that's so much fun yeah, it's really casual too. Like, that's what I love about it. I was, I was watching it with my wife the other day and I, don't, I can't remember who it was, but it was kind of like just talking about like the 
the retail crowd going crazy yet again and just bringing up some stories um, heard on the grapevine. And I was like, this is, I can get a, I can get around this and listen to this podcast. Um, well, that was the idea that it was like, this is the way we talk to each other when we're offline. We were, talk, we were sort of having these catch-ups on a Thursday afternoon and I was like, let's just put this out there for people to listen to and see what they think. Not yeah. knowing, you know, not having any idea, and that seems that I also do an interview one where I talk to another yeah. manager, and that's by far and away that it started out quietly, and it's sort of become the bigger podcast of the two. Yeah, I know. I know you had Matt Matt Joss on there. Um, I saw that yeah. on Twitter, and I was having to listen to that the other day too, which is a great interview. So, uh, you know, lots of great stuff you're producing, mate. Uh, final question from me: uh, If you could go back in time, tell yourself, tell a younger. Tobias Carlyle, something about money, finance, or investing. What would it be? Yeah, uh, start earlier would be good advice. Mm. Um, I would say what you, what you want to do is just buy reasonably good quality companies that you know will be around in five or ten years' time. Like focus first on not blowing yourself up because it's all of the restarting that that makes it a nightmare when you're learning this stuff. You just keep on buying stuff. It's garbage, and I I would. I sat in an office with a bloke who ran the, uh, the equities desk for Suncorp and Troy and a few other guys. And I'd tell them the stuff that I was buying and they just sort of laughed at themselves. Like, <laughs> you've got no idea. And they were right. I had no idea, but you know, that's how you learn. But I sort of wish I'd realized at that stage that really what you want is something that will be here in five years time. And yeah. then you can just kind of save into it. Like don't focus on making a whole lot of money. Just focus on not blowing yourself up and sort of consistently buying these things and you'd just be amazed over given time how much stuff goes up that you're in for like no effort basically so that's my, that this is sort of my philosophy now is I'm, I'm looking for stuff that i call it invincible like i'm looking for stuff that basically it can't it can't blow up it can't donut and then you know even in that group you're going to get donuts but hopefully you get fewer donuts than you get things that go up over a long period of time, you get things that go up three, five, ten times, given enough time in the market, and that's really the the secret to it. That's you know, Buffett says the rule number one is don't lose money. Rule number two is don't forget rule mm-hmm. number one. As dumb as that sounds, it's really good advice. Mm. Tobias, thanks for taking the time to join me on the show, mate. Oh, and thanks so much. This was fun. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, or ASX JEPI, J-E-P-I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion dollars as at the 16th of May, 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.